I'm just starting with the anatomy. So what uh, separates the, like what structure separates the upper and, and lower GI tract? The sole duodenum. Um, it's easier if we just, uh, yeah, just either uh, use a chat or if you're in person, just, just yell it out. But um, I heard ligament of trites. Yeah, so that's what we classical, classically use and that's in the uh, distal duodenum. So what structures are retroperitoneal? Um, does anyone have uh, the acronym? Or nice, or just known, yeah, or or just known, but yeah, that's uh, I saw it in the chat. So it's, it's sad puckers. So this is this comes up all the time, and it's important, in, especially in trauma. Um, so it stands for super renal, aorta, IVC, and then duodenum, pancreas, ureters, colon, but not it, that's excluding the transverse colon, kidneys, esophagus, and uh, rectum. So uh, that means if there's trauma to one of these that you can see retroperitoneal fluid on the FAST exam. So that's why these are high yield. Um, so what structures in our intraperitoneal? Uh, I won't go into this, belabor this too much, but kind of like everything else. So usually if you just memorize what's retroperitoneal, you can figure out what's intraperitoneal. Um, and then what is, this is an important anatomic point and it's the transition between the small intestine and colon. And it's important because there's kind of a narrowing of, of uh, the lumen here. Valve. Yeah, good. Ileocecal valve. So this is important for a few reasons. One, there's, ileo, there's kind of like an ileocecal fat pad. So you can use that to identify the appendix. And the second reason is if you have, let's say there's a patient that has a fistula with the gallbladder and the GI tract, what can you develop? Good. Yeah, gallstone ileus. And you, the characteristically, gallstones and gallstone ileus will become trapped uh, at the ileocecal valve because it's a narrowing. And then uh, if somebody has like a, a hypovolemia and, or shock, where can they get kind of ischemia of the bowel? Yep. One more. Splenic. Yeah, good. Splenic flexure and rectal sigmoid junction. And um, remember that your ischemic bowel will be anytime you have shock and you'll develop a uh, kind of pain out of proportion typically. And you can see like elevated lactate, metabolic acidosis, et cetera. All right, so now Quinn will be taking over. I see if I can multitask here. And that's just an image from uh, Blue Link to show you some of the uh, intraperitoneal structures. From anatomy? Yeah, it's from anatomy. Nice. Okay. So we have, we'll transition here to some cases. So we have a 40 year old G4 P4 with recurrent right upper quadrant pain after eating fatty slash spicy foods. Pain resolves spontaneously after two hours. BMI is 30. Vital signs of physical exam in the ED are unremarkable. What are we thinking for a diagnosis here? Cholecystitis. Yes, biliary colic or symptomatic cholelithiasis. Um, what are some risk factors for this? There's also a, like a classic saying. The F. Yeah, exactly. So I think it's like fat, female, and fertile, but obesity, female, multi-parity, age. Um, one thing I've seen in some board, board exams is TPN. A use can cause like cholesterol uh, gallstones. So that's just something to keep in mind that can come up. Also rapid weight loss can yeah. predispose you to cholesterol gallstones. Um, and then pathophys for essentially the pain in this patient. Compression against a blocked bubbler. Yeah, exactly. So specifically fatty food triggers cholecystokinin release, which leads to gallbladder contraction against the obstructed cystic duct. So then you get that colicky pain. So now, say we have a similar patient, but now they're presenting with uh, low-grade or a fever, tachycardia, and they have abrupt arrest of inspiration with right upper quadrant palpation. Yep, exactly. And then, anyone know what that what physical exam I'm describing? Yep. And then, what are the classic ultrasound findings for acute cholecystitis? The diva around the Gallbladder. Yep. What's in the gallbladder? There's like a there's like a word for it too. Starts with an S. I don't think I have that one in there. Okay. 
Sludge. Sludge. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're. Because we're not this time. Yeah, so yeah, gallstones, gallbladder wall thickening, pericholecystic fluid, and then sometimes you'll hear sonographic. Is there a person? Oh, you need this? Okay. Um, sometimes you'll see a sonographic Murphy sign. And so then treatment, I guess, how does the treatment differ for these two different presentations? Somewhat similar, but there's some differences. Take out the gallbladder, depending on antibiotics first, or if you just send them straight to the OR. Yeah. Yeah. So for biliary colic, you can do a, like an elective cholecystectomy, which you, what you might see as an answer choice. But then for um, cholecystitis, you want to do antibi- antibiotics first, like you mentioned, and then uh, urgent cholecystectomy. Okay. So just a few subtypes. What if we, if the ultrasound shows air within the gallbladder wall? Yep, exactly. So that's seen in immunocompromised of some sort. So diabetic caused by the gas forming bacteria, usually clostridium. And then this is pretty serious, can be life threatening. Um, then what if we have a patient presenting with these symptoms, but then the ultrasound doesn't show any evidence of stones? Falcons. Yes, exactly. And what kind of patient population do we see that in? Yes, yes exactly. And then treatment for that? Oh. Can you do that for nice. Yep. So you can do antibiotics in surgery. A lot of these patients, as you mentioned, are seriously ill. So you can do a percutaneous cholecystostomy if they're not stable enough for surgery. And then let's see. And then what if you see this? I don't know if I can move this, but this image, the CT, the CT scan below. What are you thinking? Porcelain gallbladder. Nice. Yep, porcelain gallbladder. Great. And then so due to just chronic inflammation, and then long-term health risks associated with this. Yes. Great. Okay, so now we have a 35-year-old male presents with sclerolectris, a fever, physical exam demonstrates tenderness to right upper quadrant on palpation. What are we thinking for diagnosis? Yes, exactly. Pucolongitis. And so this is otherwise called the Charcot's triad. Um, you, may, may, you may see Reynolds pentad. Does anyone know the two additional symptoms for that? Hypotension and... Altered mental status. Yes, yeah, good. And yep, the way, exactly. The way I think about that is like Charcot's triad is kind of your um, characteristic symptoms for the disease itself. And then because it's an infection, basically it's sepsis. Yeah, so exactly. like the last two things you'll see on the curb 65, um, at least altered mental status. So. Um, and then one thing to... One thing to keep in mind is that not it's not 100% sensitive. So patients may have cholangitis without clinically obvious jaundice. So there's something to think about. So what if we have a patient that presents similarly but doesn't have a fever? So maybe just, what are we thinking then? Yeah, exactly. So you'll still get the jaundice from obstruction, but it's not infected at this point. And then there's... Other causes of biliary obstruction other than stones, um, anyone have any thoughts? Cancer. Yep. Yep. What kind of cancer? Um, biliary tree cancer. Yes. Yep. Pancreatic. Yeah. Nice. Yep. At what part of the pancreas? Um, the head. The head, good. Great, yeah. Pancreatic head, yep. Great, so that's pretty much... All of them, um, biliary stents, something to think about. Parasites, uh, ascaris, lumbricoides, something that you might see, but yeah, you named a lot of them. And then why do these patients have jaundice? Uh, They can't flip through the liver and get through the biliary ducts. So it's it's getting back back up. Yes, exactly. There's a specific kind of biliary that's getting backed up. I'm kind of you. Yep, conjugate or direct, exactly. Um, and so that builds up in the liver and blood filtered by the kidneys. So you could also have dark urine as well. And then classic labs and imaging findings that you might see with this or to recognize it. 
Yeah. Yep. I see Billy Rubin, LFTs. Oh, yeah. yeah, so yeah, that's a great point. The cholestatic st pattern, so LCOS is going to be greater than the LFTs. And then ultrasound will show common bile duct dilation. It won't always show stones. That's one important thing is that ultrasound isn't very sensitive for stones themselves within the biliary tree. So it might not always show that, but it should show the dilation. And then treatment for this. Yep, it's one. Then something else you want to do for infection. Yep, great. So you have antibiotics and ERCP to remove the stone. And then if they're having, if they have cholelithiasis present, then you can do the, followed by the cholecystectomy. Okay, so then some subtypes of biliary tract diseases. So if I can remove this again. Uh, you can just press minimize it on the top one. Oh, nice. And I just, I don't, know, I don't know why it's not working, but there you go. I just gave away a bunch. So, um, so uh, we talked about this already. Mike already mentioned the gallstone alias. So people with chronic inflammation, the gallbladder can develop a fistula, uh, gallbladder enteric fistula that can lead to that. And then so you maybe already saw this already, but you can get what's called Mertzi syndrome. So it's essentially uh, if you have... A, something within the cystic duct that's extremely large, like a stone or a mass or a cyst or something that can compress the hepatic duct. And then you can have essentially the external compression of the hepatic duct and you can present with signs of obstruction. So I wouldn't say this is the most common thing, but it's something to know. And then now we have a patient that had a cholecystectomy before now presenting with like biliary colic symptoms. Ultrasound and CT don't show any evidence of biliary stones. And then a key thing is that the symptoms are worse with opioids. Yeah. Yeah, great. So that's, uh, geez, this. It's a sphincter of OI dysfunction. And a key thing is that worse with opioids. That's like a really, um, I guess, high yield for this at least. And so then... Diagnosis and treatment for this sphincter of oti dysfunction. Yeah, manometry, great. And then treatment is uh, sphincterotomy with BI ERCP. Okay, so now we got a 31-year-old G2P2 with right upper quadrant discomfort and pruritus. What are we thinking for that? It's a little vague, but... Sorry, I can't, I can't, yeah. Yep, primary ability cholangitis, pathophys of this, PVC, nice. Autoimmune, yep. Yep, exactly. So intrahepatic bile ducts, autoimmune, that's a key distinction to have. And then I mentioned just kind of two symptoms here. Any other classical symptoms that you would associate with this? Yep. Yeah, so you just have other signs of obstruction. So patomegaly, jaundice, potentially dark urine. And then labs. Not necessarily specific, but. I don't think it's an antibody. That's high. Yeah, there is. I'll get to, I'm just thinking in general just labs. So here, like but health, boss, ASD. Yeah. So, yeah. So you want to think the cholestatic pattern with any, you know, like biliary obstruction. Ultrasound findings are usually pretty much normal. You don't see many changes with that. And then antibody, which you talked about. Yep. Great. Antimitochondrial. And then treatments for this. Give the euros. Your acid. Yep. Yep, exactly. So urso deoxycholic acid or ursodiol is a mainstay treatment for this. So now we have a 40-year-old male with right upper quadrant pain, fever, sclerolicturus, past medical history is significant for hematochesia. What are we thinking for diagnosis? Yes, yep, exactly. 
What's the significance of the bloody stools in this patient? Ulcerative. Yep. Nice. And any antibodies that you'd think of with this? Yes, Pianka, exactly. Um, MRCP is performed. What would we see classically? Like yep, exactly. Otherwise, yep. Dilation constriction of the intra and extra hepatic ducts, and maybe you would, might see beads on a string. And then if biopsy is done to confirm the diagnosis, what is the classic kind of buzzword for that? Nice, sunny and skin fibrosis. Great. And then next step in management or just general management steps? Oops. What do you want to get on this guy in particular? Yeah. Colonoscopy. Yes, exactly. So that's colonoscopy. So actually 90% of patients with PSC have some form of inflammatory bowel disease. So it's pretty important to get that. And then Versadiol can be used. I wouldn't, it doesn't really help that much, but it's at least a medication option. And then you may see ERCP for dilation of the strictures. But in general, there's not like super great treatment for this. And then long-term complications. Sure. Yep, great. 10 to 15% risk. Okay, so I just wanted to briefly talk about these. I wouldn't say they're super high yield, but it might be something that you see. So cholidocal cysts, a couple things that are associated with that for epidemiology. Does anyone know like the, what, sorry? Pediatrics, like babies? Yep, yep, exactly. So of Asian and often less than uh, 10 years old. So usually they'll present with obstructive symptoms. They may have palpable mass diagnosed with ultrasound or CT. And then you want to treat the, you want to remove these cysts because they, there is a risk of malignancy with them. So you don't want to leave them in. And then carcinoma. So this is just a well-differentiated adenocarcinoma. Uh, there's a bunch of different risk factors for it. PSC, liver fluke infection, viral hepatitis, liver cirrhosis. And then gallbladder cancer specifically is can be adenocarcinoma or squamous cell. And then risk factors are kind of a lot of the things that we talked about, essentially any chronic inflammation. Okay, so now we have a 41-year-old woman that presents with severe epigastric pain and associated nausea and vomiting. She has had similar episodes of pain in the past associated with fatty meals. What are we thinking for diagnosis? Yes, yeah, so a specific kind of pancreatitis. What's causing the Yeah, what's causing the pancreatitis? Oh, gold cells. Yes, pancreatitis. exactly. Yeah, so it is good to try to, it's not necessarily huge for boards, but in terms of like rotations, things, it's good to specify when you can. So yeah, this person has acute gallstone pancreatitis. Um, any, the pathophys for why we, why this person's having pain with, with pancreatitis? Lower in the yep, exactly. And then so that essentially leads to just intrapancreatic activation of enzymes due to the obstruction, like we said, or in terms of like alcoholic pancreatitis, just direct, direct injury to the pancreatic abstinence cells. <clears throat> um, yeah, so what are some common causes of pancreatitis? I enlisted the two most common ones already, gallstone and alcohol. There's a couple. Yeah. Scorpion bite, yeah. I've actually <laughs> never, jumping, jumping seen, I've never actually seen that that question, but I've no. I've heard it a lot of times. Yeah. Two so let's just go with the two I most think. common first. Condenatal issue, like pancreas, pancreas diabetes. Something yeah. Like that. Yeah. Pancreas, diabetes, division, whatever. Yeah. Yep. Yep. But yeah, I heard gallstones and alcohol. Yeah, those are the big ones. We got autoimmune. I guess I get smashed. I haven't heard that one, but I'll, I'll talk about it. Oh, yeah, I think you have it. I get PP. Smashed. I have it in there. I don't have a PP in there. What is that? Um, but yeah, so hypertriglyceridemia can be one. There's certain drugs that can cause it, and then trauma. That's actually a, a pretty big one too. If you see someone with like epigastric um, pain after some kind of trauma, and then like maybe they have elevated lipase or amylase. The other big ones that. Um, are like post ERCP. I had a patient that had like three episodes of pancreatitis after ERCP because they kept doing it. And then another drug is a uh, thiazide. For some reason, I love to go after thiazides as a cause. Yeah, I have diuretics up there. Okay, nice. <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> um, and then the, the like, I was like, idiopathic gallstones, ethanol, trauma, steroid use, mumps, uh, autoimmune causes, scorpion sting, hypercalcemia, hyper uh, triglyceridemia, typically over like a thousand. Yeah. So yeah. that's like typically your patients with type one. Um, that's like the hyper um, chylomicronomia. Yeah, they, have too many they, know, they know what you mean. <laughs> uh, easy RCP and these drugs. So nice. Yeah. What's the classical clinical presentation of pancreatitis? Pain. Pain. Nice. Yeah. You might also see pain worse after meals and some nausea and vomiting as well. Physical exam findings. There's a couple of like kind of, I don't know. I can't think of the word all, all of a sudden, but there's a couple of signs. So epigastric tenderness is obviously the key one. So the colon sign, periumbilical ecchymosis, you might see um, Gray Turner sign, flank ecchymosis. I, I think I actually had this on my sub two exam, uh, this one. And then Fox sign, ecchymosis over the inguinal ligament. But it's like, I think just in general, if you see a patient that you think it might have pancreatitis and then has kind of these weird bruising somewhere that kind of think about this. Okay, do we need imaging to diagnose pancreatitis? Right. Yeah, exactly. So kind of a trick question. So not necessarily. It can be a clinical diagnosis. You need um, two of the three. So classical abdominal pain, like we talked about, pancreatic enzymes greater than three times normal or CT imaging findings. What is the most sensitive slash specific lab for pancreatitis? Is an easy one or a quick one. Nice. Yep. Light pace. Characteristic CT findings. I don't know if you'll see this on board, but you might get asked in like surgery CBL or something like that. Radiology CBL. I've seen these. Yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. I've so, seen this in the board section. What's it? Say that again. Sorry. Necrosis. Necrosis, I gotta see fat stranding. Yep, that's one, fat stranding. So parenchymal edema, fat stranding, peripancreatic free fluid. There's some other ones that are I'll talk to that are kind of um, other complications that we'll, we'll get to in a second. So just in general treatment options for pancreatitis. Yep, fluids, fluids, great. Pain control this is a pretty big one, especially on rotations. Uh, this is like a huge thing. People in pain, with pancreatitis are in severe pain. And then just manage the underlying cause. And then you can get a close disectomy if they have gallbladder pancreatitis. Okay, complications of pancreatitis. You mentioned one, necrotizing pancreatitis. Pseudocyst. Yeah, we'll, we'll see pancreatic pseudocyst. Great. Abscess, yep. I don't have that one on here, but that's a good one. And then oh, one weird one you might see is abdominal compartment syndrome. So people can get that with pancreatitis. So you just get increased intra-abdominal pressure from like fluid extravasation. And then so you ex on exam, you see tight distended abdomen. They might have nausea, vomiting, and then decreased cardiac output leading to end organ dysfunction. So just something to be aware of. And then systemic symptoms, I can just cover this quick. Um, pancreatitis can be pretty severe, pretty bad disease. So ARDS, pleural fusion, sepsis, DIC. So not something to necessarily take lightly. I'm going to say something quick about pancreatitis. Just with so a few things. So I, I heard BUN. BUN is the best predictor of mortality in pancreatitis. And that's because the main issue with pancreatitis is uh, third spacing. Yeah. And then you can also get abdominal compartment syndrome because in these patients, you all, often have to aggressively fluid resus. And um, when you have that much fluid resuscitation, it puts them at high risk for abdominal compartment syndrome. So how do you diagnose abdominal compartment syndrome? Does anyone know? Ultrasound of the bladder. It's a, yeah, you take the pressure of the bladder. Good. Uh, yeah. Nice. So these are just some images just for general knowledge. So this is in kind of a normal pancreatitis. There's some adenocarcinoma in the tail, so not really normal. But the structure is normal in terms of looking at how it looks here. So pancreatic pseudocyst, so this is what you would classically, this is a pretty large one, but what you'd see on axial CT. And then this is just a nice diagram of the kind of the fat stranding that you would see with acute pancreatitis.
why can patients with pancreatitis develop hypocalcemia? It's because you have, uh, it's actually not inactivated enzymes. You get acute fat necrosis. So you essentially get um, binding of calcium to fat in the pancreas. So a lot of times they'll like just give you like schwastic sign or something, or they'll have like spasming in a patient with obvious pancreatitis and acute pancreatitis can cause the hypocalcemia. Okay, now we have a 65 year old man with history of significant alcohol use presents with recurrent abdominal pain, diarrhea and recent night blindness. What do we think for this? Chronic pancreatitis? Yeah, great, chronic pancreatitis. So yeah, we just get chronic inflammation, auto-digestion of the pancreatic tissue, and then leading to eventual fibrosis. Um, risk factors for this, kind of already covered that. It's pretty similar. Chronic alcohol use is the most common. No. Um, any, there's a genetic cause of chronic pancreatitis. Anyone have? Yes, yes, yes. 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 <clears throat> What's the significance of the GI symptoms and night blindness in this patient? Um, yeah, it's yeah. just like bad absorption. Yeah. There you go. Yep, exactly. And that's due to, so you also get exocrine enzyme deficiency. So then you get the steatorrhea and malabsorption of the fat soluble vitamins. I already talked about diagnosis, CT, what would you see? What are some imaging findings for chronic pancreatitis? Nice. Same thing, like fat stranding. Um, atrophy, I see atrophy is a good one. Fat training, I would say, is less likely. So these are kind of the big ones, although someone had said atrophy, that's good. So calcifications is a really big one. You'll see that. And then pancreatic ductal dilations as well. Um, and then whatever, just some random pancreatic function tests that you might see. So fecal elastase, nice things. Less than 100 equals exocrine insufficiency. And then direct, measures, direct measurements, you can give like a CCK analog and secretin and then measure the enzyme levels because secretin should um, provoke enzyme release. There's a, one more lab they like to go after. It's the D-Xylose lab. So in a patient with chronic pancreatitis, will the D-Xylose uh, testing be normal or abnormal? Does anyone know what that test does? Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was for... So they like to go after in chronic pancreatitis. So D-Xylose essentially is, uh, you'll have the patient like drink um, a labeled um, substance that's D-Xylose and it measures in test, intrinsic intestinal absorption. And in patients with, with pancreatic dysfunction, the D xylose test will be normal. But in patients with like uh, intrinsic malabsorption, like celiac yeah. disease, yeah. is what they like to go after. The D xylose, they'll have, you'll see decreased absorption of D xylose, and that's measured through the urine. So they'll have decreased excretion of D xylose through the urine. Can you with Whipple? Uh, Whipple? Whipple's disease? Like a Whipple test? The Whipple test is different. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I think they use it for like small intestinal bacterial growth too. Yeah, no, um, for SIBO, the main test, you can do a culture. Um, yeah, but I'm saying I think that I've seen that. Yeah, and, and then the other one, big one is the um, lactose hydrogen test. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's the other big one. Dizylos mainly can differentiate between malabsorptive syndrome, um, syndromes and um, like exocrine issues with the pancreas. Or like you can other other said you can say like primary intestinal malabsorption or secondary yeah yeah so because primary is like structural yeah so secondary is like enzymatic yeah nice okay treatment options for chronic pancreatitis diabetic control or glucose control yep uh, yep like this nice. with a nice. <laughs> Yep. So enzyme replacement, insulin, or diabetes management, manage underlying conditions. And then pain control is a huge one for these people. I just included this. I've seen this before. Celiac ganglion block can be a treatment option for pain for long-term pain control in these patients. And then we talked about the so yeah, I think we talked about all these. Okay. Something high yield too is that enzyme replacement for the pancreas it, uh, helps with pain. Yeah. 
um, because you aren't stimulating the pancreas as much to produce um, enzymes. Got that question on you all this, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then just for your information, so we have the normal pancreas again, and then here you can see just a ton of calcifications in this chronic pancreatitis, and then here are the kind of hyperdense right here is the duct, which is like significantly more dilated than over here in the normal pancreas. Okay, so now we have 70 year old female with a 50 pack year smoking history presents to the clinic for routine checkup. Physical exam shows jaundice and a non tender right upper quadrant mass. What do we have for diagnosis here? Oh. Sorry, what'd you say? Sorry. Cancer of the liver. Nope, not the liver. Earth. Yeah, pancreatic cancer. So it's a little tricky, but I would say in general, like a big thing is painless jaundice is like a classic pancreatic adenocarcinoma. And then I'll get to the mass here in a second. Um, so risk factors for pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Okay. Yep. <laughs> that was on the title. Yeah. So I have smoking history, obviously, chronic pancreatitis, high alcohol consumption, and then just increases with age. So classic clinical features, we talked about this. So painless jaundice, they might have epigastric pain, they might have just the systemic symptoms associated with malignancy in general. And so physical exam findings, this is related to the mass in the original question stem. I know at least a couple of things. <laughs> so here's, it's called the, I don't even know, Corbosier. I don't even know how to say that. I've never heard it said. It's, but, uh, it's a, a dead French guy. I can help you with that. French is my first language. Okay, what is it? Okay, nice. So there, that's a good. Uh, Yo, I'm not saying <laughs> So it's so it's that for everyone listening virtually. PSG <laughs> law. But so you get an enlarged non-tender gallbladder with painless jaundice. So that's the um, non-tender right upper quadrant mass. You might also see a trousseau sign, so migratory thrombophlebitis, um, which is just like the kind of like, I don't know how to describe it exactly, erythema and like yeah. cords. Superficial uh, erythema of the vein. Yeah. Um, and it, it will typically present as like a tender. Pa like a palpable uh, cord sometimes. Tender palpable cord on physical exam. And in these patients, they will have it in different parts of the body. So normally you'll, so normally a question will, you, they'll present with that and you'll know it's um, superficial thrombophlebitis. And normally it's uh, conservative treatment with like NSAIDs. Yeah, um, but if they have migratory and they've had recurrent episodes of this, then you want to think about doing a CT for imaging for uh, pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Yeah, exactly. And then just not to be confused with the uh, trousseau signs of hypocalcemia, which is that the is that the blood pressure that's test? About, yeah, that's bad. That's I always get bad. down mixing the spastics. Yeah. <laughs> okay, labs for pancreatic cancer. The markers, I should say. Yeah. Good. Yep. CA ninety nine, and then I also have CA less specific, but if you have to know one, definitely CA ninety nine. Like mentioned, imaging already, abdominal CT, and then treatment in general. There's kind of treatment for the head and and tail. Oh, Whipple. Whipple for head. Yep. Tail. Nothing too resection. crazy. Yeah, <laughs> just resection, and then if unresectable, then we're just treating essentially palliative, so biliary stent to prevent like symptoms of obstruction and then chemo. Esophagus, nice, nice image there, Mike. So we have 35 year old male with HIV, last CD4 column was 49, presents with odinophagia, EGD shows linear ulcers. What do we think for diagnosis? Barrett's SCC, nope, thinking of something a little different. Um, Think about the HIV, CMV, nice. CMV esophagitis. So that's the linear ulcers is kind of specific for CMV and biopsy will, will show what for CMV? 
Mike's just Hawkeye. Mike. <laughs> that was me. That was no, I know. Can you say owl eyes? Nice. So atypical lymphocytes, intranuclear inclusion bodies, the, the owl eye. And treatment for that. Yeah. Yep, IV and cyclovir, nice. Mm -hmm. So now we have a 35-year-old male, CD4, column 49 again, but the EGD shows well circumscribed, punched out ulcers. <clears throat> Another virus. Yep. Yep, nice. HSV esophagitis. What does the biopsy show for this one? I would say it's not as um, buzzwordy as the CMV one, but so we just have multinucleate giant cells, eosinophilic, inclu eosinophilic inclusions, ground glass nuclei. Treatment for this. Yep, nice, acyclovir. Finally, we have another patient, C4 count is now 98. EGD shows yellowish mucosal plaques. It's a diagnosis. Axis. Yep, and esophagitis. Treatment is. Yep, antifungal specifically. Fluconazole? Fluconazole? Yep, so azoles, fluconazole, voriconazole. You, uh, this is like the nice stand rinse, right? That's so, for, that's for, for like oral. oral. But if you have, if you have like. If it's, uh. Canada. If you have yeah, esophagitis, yeah, yeah. you want to take it. If you have esophagitis, you don't use But yeah, if so, it's just oral, you do the nice statin rinse. Exactly. Can you ever do the, the name? It's another kind of uh, antibiotic. Kind of can? Kind of yeah. Can you do that? You can, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, what do we have here? 65-year-old woman with recent diagnosis of osteoporosis presents with dysphagia and retrosternal pain. What do we think for this one? Pillosophagitis, I see. Nice. Yep, pillosophagitis. Great. Risk factors for this are, are like common medications. Yep, bisphosphonates is one. That's kind of the big one, bisphosphonates to think about. Edsens, iron, there's probably more, but... There's one um, potassium, yeah. iodine, the, the yeah. potassium chloride. They love to go after that one. I, have yeah. no idea I think why. I feel like a lot of the I mean, vitamins, like calcium, potassium. Yeah, they, they all. Yesterday, I saw them. Like, yeah, right I've gotten it wrong like ten times. And then prevention. This is uh, kind of a vague one, but just send essentially take with food and water. Take with standing up. Okay, now we have a five-year-old presents with drooling hematemesis after they were unsupervised in the kitchen. Any thoughts on this? Those? Good, yeah, good idea. Drano, yeah. So corrosive esophagitis, car caustic esophagitis. So risk factors, typically you see it in young children, but also think about it in people with recent suicidal ideation. How do you diagnose this? Yeah, endoscopy is indicated if they're symptomatic or have like evidence of oral burns. And then treatment, I'll, this one's kind of vague, but so if they're asymptomatic, you can observe, you can put an NG tube in if they have extensive circumferential burns, so they have difficulty swallowing. And then a key thing is you don't need, you don't use neutralizing agents or activated charcoal. That could be an answer choice. I think the neutralizing agent caused what, heat? So yeah, it yeah, caused like a reaction yeah, between yeah, us, so you don't want to like, like, do that. Think about like in chemistry class when you mix them together and you get like those... What is it? Every reaction is exothermic, but like one. You know what I mean? They always say like you, every textbook you read will say, "Don't play chemist." You know what I mean? You're in medicine. Don't be a chemist. Yeah. You're not Walter White. Yeah, just water. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah you just use saline because we're fancy. But... And then just general complications. Nothing too crazy. Yep, esophageal perforation or and then respiratory compromise is something to think about.
Okay, so now we have a 21-year-old QW Madison student is out last night for their birthday, multiple episodes of vomiting. Now with severe retrosternal pain, crepitus is palpated. I should say on the chest. Perforation. Yes, exactly. Perforation. So you perforation may see Borod syndrome. Um, another common cause is uh, recent upper endoscopy, so iatrogenic. So also consider this in patients that had recent upper endoscopy. Um, imaging for this, what do you what are some options or what you would see? I guess it's not very clear, but so, uh, water soluble contrast. <laughs> nice, yeah. So that's it. So I put it here. Yeah, contrast is off. He's off of God. <laughs> yeah, I can't even say it. But that's the gold standard. Castograph and overbarium when you suspect perforations. And then the chest x-ray might show widened or pneumomediastinum, which is related to the crepitus that we talked about. What treatment options for this? Repair. Repair is one, um, but actually you can manage it conservatively initially. So if they're hemodynamically stable, you just MVO, obviously, PPI, and then IV antibiotics to prevent infection. But you can use you can do surgery if they're hemodynamically in, unstable. So something to consider. Now we have another similar student. Yeah, several episodes of vomiting. Notice hematemesis with the last episode. Severe retrosternal pain, no crepitus or sub Q emphysema on exam. Malory yeah, nice. Smelly was. Yeah, you what? What did I do? I think you added some things. I didn't. I was like, what? <laughs> um, and then test for this. Scoping. Yeah, that there you would use a scope. Whereas the perforation. There's risk of like worsening it if you use a scope. And then, so treatment for this one? Conservative. Yeah, conservative. So antiemetic, if they're still nauseous, to prevent further episodes of vomiting and then PPI. Okay, now we have 60 year old with halitosis. Barium esophagram is shown below. What do we think for diagnosis here? Diverticulum. Zanker diverticulum, yep. Pathophys for that. Fine. The, the muscle has an issue and then you have a defect. Yes, exactly. So like the thyropharyngeal, cricopharyngeal parts, pharyngeal constrictors are some buzzwords that you might see. And that then false. That'd be, that'd be yeah, false. that's false. Yep. What's yep. a true diverticulum? What's a exactly. yep. what uh do you have an example of one? Meckles? Good. Nice, yeah. That's the big one. That's the big one. Yep. And then treatment for this. Yeah, I don't have the specific specific procedure, but yeah, just in general, if they're having severe symptoms, myometry, yeah, nice. Indicated for symptomatic. And endoscopy versus open are just options. Okay. 51-year-old male with chest pain, nighttime cough, hoarseness, dental erosions. Diagnosis for this. I would say it's a, not a classical presentation. Worse when laying flat. Third. GERD. Yep. Nice. So this isn't a classical presentation with GERD, but these are all symptoms and, and can be something that you would see if they want to be a, a little more tricky. But what is what is GERD classically? What symptoms do you see? Heartburn, nice. After eating, lying down. Yeah. So epigastric pain, dyspepsia, dysphagia, regurgitation, retrosternal pain. Risk factors, I can just go through smoking, obesity, pregnancy, stress. Tests for this. Yeah, so you, this is a clinical, but yes, exactly. Gold standard is the 24-hour intraesophageal pH monitoring. Initial management or conservative management. CPI. Yeah, so always lifestyle changes first, but then yeah, PPI and H2 receptor blockers. So now we have the same patient um, was given PPIs, didn't prove he has had symptoms for several years. What do we want to do now? Next steps. Yeah, exactly. So on a scope, biopsy shows metaplas metaplastic columnar epithelial epithelium with goblet cells. What are we thinking there? Yep. 
Um, patient with history of GERD now has dysphagia with solid foods. What are we thinking? Sure. Yes, potentially. Sure. I'm just saying, but yeah, you do want to think about malignancy, but yeah, esophageal stricture, Schatzky's ring can happen sometimes before malignancy. Um, so that's what I have in this next one. So you think about if they usually will have, if they just have like dysphagia solid foods, it's maybe more likely stricture. If they have other symptoms of malignancy, then you want to think about that. And then risks are similar, GERD, Baird, smoking, C tests. These ones are pretty cool. Okay, so now we have a patient with history of alcohol use disorder. Now has dysphagia, put in aphasia, anemia, weight loss. Oh, I guess I am just miss. So that was a esophageal adenocarcinoma, and this is esophageal squamous cell carcinoma. So a key distinction between these is so GERD and Baird esophagus and smoking is risk factor for adenocarcinoma, whereas alcohol, smoking, and HPV are risk factors for squamous cell carcinoma. What a part of the esophagus does squamous cell carcinoma affect? It's the upper. Yeah, upper. Good. Two thirds. Nice. Yeah, two thirds. Nice. Would adeno then be the distal? Yeah, yeah. still two one third, right? Is that that junction? Yep. Yeah. Okay. The, and that makes sense because third is the biggest predisposition predisposition with Barrett's esophagus, which would be at the closest junction to the stomach. Nice. Yeah. What if you have a child with strider, wheezing, dysphagia with solid foods? This is more of a peds one, but. Oh, the trying to Yeah. That is that's a possibly like up. That's like yeah. secretion. Oh, okay. It's early. Yeah. Okay. Let's say um, they have strider at rest, and then it doesn't improve with prone positioning. Yeah. Is it you may not have seen this yet. Oh, it's biphasic. Okay. It's a ring. It's yeah. 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 Okay. Nice. Yep. T4. Bring around the soft and the vessels. Nice. Okay. Some imaging stuff here. So we have a 51-year-old with a history of severe GERD. Imaging is shown below. What do we have for diagnosis here? It's a little tricky. I, don't, I haven't seen many of these. Picture. Yeah. Mm. What do you see at the top? Yeah. Look at kind of like this hiatal hernia. Nice. Yep. So here's kind of, this is like part of the stomach and it's kind of pushing in here. So hiatal hernia is like a little bit, if the whole part of the fundus goes through, then you, it's called a parasophageal hernia. So that's something to, to think about. Oh, I guess I wrote that here. Parasophageal hernia. <laughs> Treatment for this, treatment op options, especially for like parasophageal hernia for severe. Yeah, surgery. Yeah, surgery. There's a specific name for it. Oh, yeah, close. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. It's in great. And then there's a common ulcer associated with hiatal hernias. Does anyone know the eponym for that? Very low yield. It's, it's, it's high yield in gen surge rotations, not in. Dying. Uh, it's not that, but that's a good thing to think about. Cameron ulcer. I've been I've been asked this multiple times. Really? Yeah. Not on my desk. Yeah, that made it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they ask you like, oh, what's the 50s ribosomal? <laughs> yeah, if I do, I get it wrong. So we have 51 year old with chest pain after eating. The imaging shows this. What do we think for diagnosis? No. Looks like a cork esophageal spasm. I see in the chat. Nice. Yeah. yeah, this is the cork. This is pretty classic. The corkscrew. Treatment for this? So small meals in general, nitrates, calcium channel blockers, Botox, and then more invasive like dilation and surgery are options. Yeah, you want to relax the smooth muscle. That's one way to think about it. Yeah, and then uh, th these patients will usually present with like uh, retrosternal pain following like stress or anxiety yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. Yesterday. 
Dude, it's all classic. It's all just it's getting all classic, classic questions. Dude, it's all classic. I haven't seen those in years. Yeah, yeah. Question on. Fifty-one year old with progressive dysphagia to solids and liquids. We see this esophagram. Oh. Achalasia, I see in the chat. Nice. Pathophys. Like, Tightening um, of the muscle. Yeah, the LES is like the total basis. What, what yep. kind of neurons do you lose? Vagal oh, dysfunction. Do you lose stimulatory or inhibitory neurons? Inhibitory. Nice, yeah. So an atrophy of inhibitory neurons. Treatment, I have uh, treatment for this. In the myopia. Yeah, the, yes. The I mean, that's I'm, not the that's not the first, but it's you first. You want to similar to esophageal spasm, so try to relax it, and then you can do. This is a pretty like morbid for surgery, so you can do like Botox. Yeah, so yeah. it wouldn't be the first thing that you would want to do. What is an option? The other thing is sometimes on the shelf or like on the MBMEs, they like to ask about diagnosis, and you may think you can diagnose it like clinically, but a lot of times you want to get a scope because you want to rule out pseudoachalasia or oh, like yeah. adenocarcinoma or something like that. So yeah. usually you want to get a scope in these patients. Sometimes they ask about uh, associated infection uh, with achalasia. Oh, these the uh, tigers. Tigers, there you go. Nice. Yeah. Sometimes they ask that. Nice. So, woman with significant alcohol use and severe knee arthritis presents with epigastric pain and dyspepsia. Yeah. There's some risk, the risk factors in this. Okay, acute gastritis. So, um, Risk factors are alcohol use and NSAID use, which is what I was getting at with the severe knee arthritis. Um, so you want to treat that with cessation of the fending agent, try some PPIs, and then work up further if needed. So now we have a 51-year-old woman immigrated from Mexico six years ago, presents with epigastric pain. Trial of PPI provides limited relief. This is kind of similar, but H. pylori gastritis. So. So they can, there's different kinds of, of gastritis, different causes. Um, and then the H. pylori gastritis is classically in the stomach antrum. So something to think about. Tests for H. pylori? So, you can do a stool antigen. Yeah. There's the breath test. Or yeah, yeah, that's what I had. I do a rea breath test, but yeah, the stool one, and then you can do EGD as well. EGD and biopsy, exactly. Treatment for H. pylori? Yeah, yeah there's... So I have the three. So there is a four. I think yeah, there's, there's a four. The triple therapy. You want to show the triple therapy? Yeah, this is a triple. So PPI, amoxicillin, and macrolide. So there's triple therapy, and then if they're allergic to amoxicillin, there's quadruple therapy. Mm -hmm. What do you replace? What antibiotic you use in quadruple therapy, and what metal do you add? Does anyone know? Is it bisbee's? Oh, yeah, it's bismuth. Yeah, I was like, oh, that was pretty good. Yeah. It's bismuth and metronidazole in uh, quadruple therapy. Nice. So we have a 50 year old woman with epigastric pain. Exam demonstrates peripheral neuropathy, anemia, MCV of 110. What do we think here? You just got it all. Autoimmune gastritis. Nice. And so this typically affects the fundus of the stomach. You have destruction of the parietal cells, so then you have limited intrinsic factor. Limited intrinsic factor, which is involved in that. Okay, I think this is last slide, or second to last slide. We'll go through it quick. 39-year-old presents with gnawing epigastric pain. Pain is worse after meals. Specific kind, peptic ulcer disease, specifically gastric. Risk factors for that, H. pylori and NSAIDs are the big one. Test, EGD, um, biopsy, more necessary um, in gastric ulcers because they have a higher risk of malignancy. So what if we have a patient with epigastric pain, but pain improves after meals? Yeah, exactly. So that's a big thing to differentiate them. And then 
This is more often associated with H. pylori, but lower risk of a malignancy. What if we have gnawing epigastric pain? EGD reveals multiple jejunal ulcers. Open to this. Yes, nice, great. So you get hypergastrinemia, stimulation of parietal cells, increased acid. So key thing, jejunal ulcers are, shouldn't happen, shouldn't be that distal. So if you see that, then you know something is definitely wrong. Serum diagnosed with serum gastrin greater than 1,000. And then you might see secretin stimulation tests. So normally secretin should inhibit gastrin, but in this case, it wouldn't. Patient with severe burns is admitted to SICU. The resident forgets to order routine meds. Patient now with hematemesis. Thoughts on this one? So curling ulcer, um, stress ulcer, I guess. So essentially you get this with severely ill patients, decreased plasma volume. So then you have hypoxic tissue injury. So you want, that's why you give PPIs in, in burn patients. I can't you see those just in any sort of severe disease state? So, so curling ulcers specifically like burns. Oh. Um, so it's like, you think of it as a curling iron, is a burn, so you oh, get the curling yeah. ulcer. <laughs> and then there's a there's this next one too. That's like, so, so basically in patients with burn, I have this in a later slide that we might not get to, but you want to give them prophylactic PPIs. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> You no, know, I have like a burn treatment layout thing. You know what I mean? Like I have a slide on it. Anyone know this one? Pushing ulcer, nice. Yep. Pathophys of this. So essentially with the head injury, you get increase of vagal stimulation. And then that leads to more stomach acid via acetylcholine re release, which activates parietal cells. And then someone mentioned this before, Dulafoy lesion. So I can just go through that. Abnormally large artery in the lining of the GI system, and you might see this on EGD, and this can cause life-threatening hemorrhage in patients that have this. And you remember cushing also because you want to cushion your head when you fall. <laughs> Dang, that was that was tough. <laughs> no, I'm literally saying you should like remember. That's how you remember. I'm not making a joke. <laughs> I was going to say, that's what I think of. <laughs> yeah. Yo, you guys are just hating. <laughs> Let's move on. Let's move on. Let's move on. Okay, so 70-year-old male presents with epigastric pain, weight loss, early satiety, supraclavicular lymphadenopathies palpated on exam, hemoglobin 10.5. Yes, gastric adenocarcinoma, great. What are some risk factors for this? Japanese heritage. Uh, that's that's what I'll keep doing. Yeah. Something comes to mind. Yeah, that's a big one. Yeah. High salt diets, yeah. nitrosamine. Yeah. Yep, exactly. So processed meat, tobacco, H. pylori, and then also autoimmune gastritis can predispose you to that as well. Some physical exam eponyms. One is this patient has just some. Things associated with that are related to the lymph nodes, the physical exam findings. Yeah, yeah like what would you call like the, uh, like? It starts with the V. Yep. Oh, varicose. Yep, varicose node. Yeah. So that's the supraclavicular nodes, and then you might see sister sister Mary Joseph nodule, which is a periumbilical nodule, which is indicative of gastroadenocarcinoma. Tests for this patient. Yep. And then treatment, pretty. Yeah, you use yeah. the age of the CT. Yep. Good. And then I just include some random high yield associations. I'll just go through them because it's kind of hard to that indicate metastatic disease, or maybe maybe people know them. There's a couple, there's like, I have three signs um, <clears throat> that indicate metastatic disease. Two of them are derm finding. Yeah. Sir. So if you were here a couple Sir. weeks ago, you had... Like, the, it's in the back. Yeah, um, yeah. not always in the back. Right. Lesser tray loss. Yeah, lesser so that's, tray, yeah. you, you develop uh, a diffuse um, subarachnoid keratosis. Exactly. And then, so then we get, we also have malignant acanthosis nigricans. And then the Krockenberg tumor is just bilateral ovarian tumors. Indicating gastric adenocarcinoma. Cool.
Um, I have a couple extra slides. I don't want to run over too much. Do you guys want me to go through them or no? There's quite a pretty slides. Uh, uh, like, like 12. A lot. <laughs> yeah, I might not go over them. I mean, if we'll we go over a couple. Really yeah, I'll go over them really quick, maybe. I'll try to keep it, keep it kind of short. Okay. Um, so vascular, um, these are, they should be really like pretty easy. So like, let's say this guy, I mean, he he's, has like a huge pack uh, smoking history, abdominal pain rating to the back. Let's say he has a past history of like a triple A. Rupture. Rupture. Yeah, so triple A rupture. So what age do you normally screen for triple A? 65, good. Risk factors, I uh, went over them, smoking. Indications for repair, what size? Does anyone know? Five yeah, five and a half centimeters, or if it's rapidly expanding. What neural complication you get with the ruptured AAA? Um, it's like a specific part of the spinal cord will be ischemic. Oh, yeah, like... Anterior, posterior. Anterior. Anterior, yeah. good. And then what GI complication you get with the AAA rupture? We talked about this earlier. Oh, like uh, shock. Shock, yeah. So you get ischemic bowel. Good. Okay. So uh, peripheral artery disease, what symptoms do you get? What's like your characteristic? Cla claudication. Good. So patients will be like, I can walk like one half of a block and I get to this mailbox and then it hurts. It's chronic. And it's chronic. And it doesn't improve with like leaning forward. All right. And then treatment for PAD. I mean, it, there's a, it's graded. So you do graded exercise, which does not improve mortality, smoking cessation, do antiplatelet therapy, and then salostazole. Do antiplatelet therapy can improve mortality because it decreases the risk of MI. Salazazole is um, is purely for um, symptomatic benefit. Okay, where are ulcers located in PAD? It's the most distal area, so the distal toes. And then you can have risk of uh, gangrene in severe PAD. And then aortoiliac triad, either know or you don't kind of thing. Okay, you all know it. Um, so... Uh, so, buttock claudication, impotence, decreased femoral pulses. Uh, those are the days doctors used to smoke cigarettes. Uh, okay, um, this one is a derm one. So, you'll see this in like all your patients. What is this? In in the hospital. Yeah, venous stasis dermatitis. And it's because of venous insufficiency. Um, I won't go over that. And then where do you usually get ulcerations with... Uh, Nice. Medial yeah. malleolar is good. And so in uh, venous insufficiency, you get medial malleolar um, ulcers. And then treatment, usually, you know, you'll hear this a lot, compression stockings. And then you can, how do you confirm your diagnosis of this? Of what's causing this? Don't overthink it. Maybe what imaging do you get? The ultrasound? Yeah, duplex ultrasound. Good. And you'll see reflux. Um, okay. Let's say a patient after a Endocrine surgery, like thyroidectomy, develops like a neck mass, difficulty breathing. What do they have? Right, 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 right there. No, yeah, dude, I, I came out. No, dude, I came out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what, well, what caused it? Okay, this one actually might have been. It's because of institutional stasis. Um, okay, we'll just... Um, what are other complications of thyroid surgery? Hypocalcemia. Good. Hypocalcemia because you injured what? Parathyroid. Parathyroid's good. And then what other nerve can you injure? Sure. Yeah, if they're like horse, so you can image the damage to the other Okay, uh, let's see. If you have these are just thyroid nodules, so if you have a thyroid nodule, no symptoms, what do you do next? Yes. TSH, good. You want to check with functioning. And then what do you do after TSH if it's uh, like uh, normal? If TSH is normal, Final you want to do ultrasound and then you can do a fine needle aspiration. Uh, what's the most common thyroid cancer? Oh, I didn't do whatever. Um, okay, what's the most common, like, what's the most common, like, hereditary cause of uh, thyroid cancer? Men. Medullary, yeah, like, medullary carcinoma is what I was thinking of. Men's syndromes, um, and then treatment of thyroid cancer? Sorry. Yeah, resection. And then you want to monitor them post-op, so you can monitor calcitonin and medullary can thyroid cancer. And you usually give them TSH, um, or uh, T4. To prevent growth. Um, okay, I'm just going to go over these MEN quick. So MEN1 is like your three Ps. So it's parathyroid, pituitary, and pancreatic. And then MEN2, I just think of these. They have an increased risk of medullary thyroid and pheochromocytoma. And I remember that because if you have an increased risk of medullary thyroid cancer, you're going to want to do surgery. 
And these patients, you're going to want to assess for pheochromocytoma so you can give them alpha blockers before surgery. So that's how I remember MEN2. And it's a ret gene mutation. That's a guy from Airplane. If you haven't seen that movie, it's good. Okay. What do you Okay. Um, I'm just going to go over skin cancer. They test this on the surgery boards. It's kind of like part of the MVME thing. So it's in medicine too, I think. They do in medicine, but no one from medicine is here. So um, so I'll just go over these quick. Um, so AKs are kind of those gritty, scaly plaques you see often uh, older patients, kind of like on the forehead and temples. Precursor squamous cell carcinoma on the boards, you're going to want to biopsy it because there is some risk for, um, or for squamous cell. Um, but otherwise, you can also use cryo uh, and 5 of or a mode. And that's what it looks like. Okay. What if there's like a cup-shaped tumor and has keratin debris inside of it? What's that called? It's grown. Starts with a K. Uh, it's called a keratoacanthoma. It's kind of a well-differentiated form of uh, squamous cell um, treatment. So they technically can regress on their own, but we almost always surgically excise them. That's what it looks like. So if you see that, cut it out. Okay. Uh, all right. So... Basically, I, this slide is just so I can show you how to distinguish squamous cell and basal cell. So squamous cell is like scaling and it's erythematous, and basal cell is pearly and has telangiectasias, which are blood vessels. Squamous cell, one you might see in your surgery shelf, is um, in like chronic scarring and with chronic scars, wounds, or like burns, you can see something called a marginal ulcer. So if somebody has like a uh, continually non-healing ulcer that's like painful and they've had a long-term injury there, you're going to want to biopsy it because it could be squamous cell carcinoma. All right, and then basal cell carcinoma looks like that. You'll see telangiectasias and it'll be more pearly. There's usually not an overlying scale. Um, melanoma, you just want to know that you're going to want to do a wide local excision. And what's the most important thing for uh, prognosis in melanoma? Depth. Depth, Breslau depth. And usually after how many millimeters do you want to do a sentinel limb cell biopsy of depth? Usually what I've heard is one millimeter of depth. Okay, good. Um, okay, burn. So I'm just going to have this here. You can pause it on the recording if you want to see it. Um, and this is my uh, Parkwind man that I drew with my mouse. I really want to show this. Rule of nines, so I have it up there, but basically... I'm not going to say it. <clears throat> okay, what's the, why, do you, why do we use Parkland's formula? What's it for? What does it guide? Resuscitation. It guides fluid resuscitation. Good. So that's what we initially used for fluid resuscitation. Does anyone know it quick? 4.5 times the total percent. Yeah, it's like 4 mils um, times the percent affected of second and third degree burns, and then times your weight in kilograms. And then how do we administer the Parkland's formula? What we get from that? What's the timing of it? Half in the first nine hours, eight hours. Eight hours, good. Yeah, half in the first eight hours, the rest in the next 16 hours. Um, what type of crystalloid do we use to res uh, resuscitate burn patients? LR. Uh, LR. Why do we use LR? Uh, uh, electrolytes. They love us. Well, saline also has electrolytes. What? You get metabolic acidosis. Yeah, good. Why? Why do we get metabolic acidosis with uh, normal saline? Chloride. Chloride, good. <clears throat> All right. Um, and then what guides resuscitation after initial Parkland uh, formula? So it, urine output, good. And what do we uh, go for? What's our goal for urine output? Uh, yeah, it's, it's half a mil per kg per hour. Nice. Sorry I'm going so fast. I was trying to... Uh, and then how do we measure the output? Yeah, so you want to do uh, early calf. For exclamations. I know, it's uh, it's important. That's how early you do it. <laughs> All right, what else do we give burn patients? <laughs> oh, here's what I was talking about. It's two things. What <laughs> hormone do we give them? Aries, we should give them an insulin as well. Um, I'm thinking testosterone and then PPIs. Um, and then what kind of surgery you want to do if they have like a circumferential burn that's like fasciotomy. full thickness, non-fasciotomy. We're trying to avoid a fasciotomy, escherotomy. So we do an escherotomy because if you leave it, basically you get venous stasis and pooling and it can predispose you to uh, compartment syndrome. So we do an escherotomy where we basically like make a line through the escar. Put the skin open, release some pressure. 
But yeah, the fascia, yeah, I mean, that's, that's lower down the fascia. Yeah. A yeah. fasciotomy is like when you have acute compartment syndrome, you need to make um, incisions into the fascia to release pressure. Mm -hmm. With an escarotomy, you are making an incision into the escar through the entire escar to prevent development of compartment syndrome. Yeah, it's like a little laser tool and just the skin kind of separates. 